Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today it's our great pleasure to have uh, George Hoffman here. So Dr. Hoffman is a research physical scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He received um, a BS in physics um, from Ohio State and a PhD in meteorology from MIT. He was an assistant professor at University of Maryland College Park and then moved to GSFC in 1988, where he consulted until entering government service in 2012. His primary focus has been the design, implementation, and extension of satellite gauge combined estimates of global precipitation. Uh, the resulting data sets include the GPCP monthly and daily products, the NASA TRIM, multi-satellite precipitation analysis, and the NASA GPM missions integrated multi-satellite retrieval. Um, he is a deputy project scientist for GPM, the lead for GPM multi-satellite algorithm team, and the chief of the mesoscale atmospheric processes laboratory. His research has resulted in um, 124 publications, and his recent awards include Fellow of American Meteorological Society uh, in 2019, a NASA Exceptional Service Medal in 2018, a NASA Exceptional Achievement Medal in 2015, and a NASA GSSFC Robert Gather Aller Award for Science in 2014. Let's welcome the speaker. Thank you. I'm live, yeah. I will issue the traditional invitation that there's lots of good seats up front <clears throat> for those of the people in the back. Of course, my throat is not cooperating today, so I'm gonna be working on a Coke here. Um, so thank you um, for the invitation. I actually got invited previously, and I was like, oh, the data set's not quite ready, and so I pushed off until now. So thank you for keeping me on the list. Um, the, the name list at the top line is the folks at Goddard who are the primary iMERGE uh, team. Um, and then there are other people who are on the uh, <clears throat> multi-satellite uh, team for GPM, which are listed in the, in the rest and lots of different places. This is a team effort. You know, it, takes, it takes a lot of people to make this go. And the people on the lower list are no less important uh, for they contribute code and analyses. So let's get started. I, I use this title slide at EGU, and, and these days they're really sticky in Europe about taking pictures. And so you had to put that logo in the lower right-hand corner if you wanted to allow people to take pictures of your slides. I'm shameless. I will push my data set any place, and if you want to promote it for me, that's the, all, all the better. Okay, so let's get started. <clears throat> so I'm going to step back. There's some different backgrounds in the audience, and so some of you know this, and some of you this might be sort of new. The, the idea is that when I was working with Bob Adler back in the old days in GPCP, and suddenly there was a second SSMI, and I don't think Ralph is here. Ralph Rowe in particular was beating us up because we weren't using both satellites. But at the time, it, we had this intuitive feeling that if you used satellites from around the day, they weren't evenly spaced, and so you'd end up with a diurnally biased sample. As we got more and more satellites, it's like, mm, we got to do something about this. And so in the trim era, we, uh, this was not mission creep. This was mission gallop. It was not originally part of, of trim. But in fact, we, we piece things together every three hours, and this is the TMPA you happen to hear about in the introduction. What we've sort of settled on is that we really want three-hour observations globally, that is, actual data from the satellites. Originally, we thought that because we need about every three hours in order to get the diurnal cycle with some accuracy. But it's also turned out since then that Morse microwave loses skill pretty fast outside plus minus 90 minutes. And so you need samples often enough that the morphing has some integrity. The current 
uh, constellation. So this is, uh, sorry, as a function of year starting at the beginning of the modern microwave era with a, the SSMI on F8. This is the second half of the day because they're polar orbiters. The first half of the day looks the same. Um, over time, we've had lots of satellites. They sort of wander around. Um, really interesting orbital dynamics drive that. The current constellation has something like five polar orbit passive microwave imagers, which we think of as the good stuff, and six polar orbit passive microwave sounders, although Sapir is, is struggling to um, get its data out. Out of that, we create uh, input precipitation estimates from the individual satellites using the low orbit um, passive microwave routine GPROF, which is run by Chris Kumaro now at uh, Colorado State, except um, we use, there's a, a separate algorithm that Chris Kidd put together for Safir because it has pretty limited data and GPROF was having trouble. For the GOIR data, which if you'd asked me 20 years ago, I would have said we would have been done with that by now, but it turns out to be integral in the long term. We're using the Persian CCS algorithm, which comes out of uh, University of California, Irvine. The CORA, which is combined radar radiometer, um, it's the KU radar, is a combined passive active, and we think of that as the best estimate of precipitation from first trim and then um, the GPM core observatory. And finally, to do some overall scaling, we actually still use the GPCP monthly satellite gauge combination because at the high latitudes, the, the uh, GPM stuff is low. So this constellation evolves. You can see that, and it continues to evolve. The launch manifests in the future are not necessarily guaranteed for imagers. There's some, but not a lot. No, we think not enough. That's a separate issue. Okay. So here's a quick description of iMERGE. So it's this unified algorithm at the code level, which uses Kalman filter Seymour from Ping Ping's group. Um, and we depend mightily on that. Persian CCS, which gives us the IR estimates. Uh, the old TMPA, which I led at Goddard. And then uh, we do the processing in a separate organization called Precipitation Processing System at Goddard. This is really important for me as a developer because that means I don't depend, I, it's not, doesn't depend on me on a given day whether a particular satellite came in and whether a particular routine crashed. They handle that and then they complain to us when it's the fault of the code. Um, so we have this single integrated code system which we apply three different times. We do this because in, started by accident, TMPA, we ran it twice once for in near real time and once in production. And we discovered that even in near real time, we really had different sets of users. So now we have two near real time, early and late, four and 14 hours after observation time, which are appropriate for different uh, applications. And then the final is research quality about three months later, because we're waiting for the gauge. Um, and as you step down that list, you get more and more data and presumably better and better answers. It's a half hourly, and then the final by only has a native monthly product as well. It's a tenth of degree global, um, good old Latlon grid, although we want to change that, but not yet. Um, the morph precipitation is now global, but um, it's masked out, as I'll describe. The infrared depends on the data set that only goes 60 to 60. So outside of that, we don't have infrared yet. On the right-hand side, you see the list of uh, fields. We don't just give you precipitation. Um, at one point in the TMPA, we had very num small number of data fields. And what we discovered as developers and what the users told us was, we need to know more information about sort of the intermediate steps. And so there's some intermediate information here uh, that helps understand what's going on. And I'll describe these in a minute. So it's, iMERGE is adjusted to the GPCP climatology zonally to, a time, to get a bias profile that's reasonable. And that's because GPM uh, pro core observatory products by their design look like each other and unfortunately get low as you go to high latitudes. 
And so this is uh, GPCP is closer. It's not necessarily the right answer, but we know it's closer than what uh, the bias is that we're getting out of GPM. Um, yeah, over land, the GPCP adjustment gives you a first cut at the adjustment to gauges. The gauges we use are a monthly gauge product that comes out three months after real time. So clearly, we're not using gauges in the near real time products. And so this adjustment gives you at least a climatological jostling toward a lower bias over land. This is originally put together, as the slide was originally put together and talking about GPM era. But now that we're back in the trim era, the same uh, bias concerns apply. Yeah. So here's examples of the data field. It's a little bit of an eye test because these each used to be a page, and now I've squeezed them down to get them all on one page. Uh, but the thing that we sort of hand out for real is uh, the precipitation field. But in order to give you a better sense of what's happening, on the one hand, the half hourly microwave field as observed and, and calibrated together is shown, and the infrared is shown. So if you want to know what the background fields look like, they're there. We tell you the time after observation. Oh, and I'm supposed to be using the pointer because there are people online. Sorry, people online. Um, there we go. So in the middle left is a time field. It actually tells you to the nearest minute when those microwave data were observed. And the top left, which satellite observed them, or at least satellite types. Um, direct result of users' requests in the middle right is the probability of liquid phase, so that it have a sense of whether it's rain or snow. Um, this is a diagnostic. It's not derived from the satellite data. It is globally complete. So if you have a different precipitation estimate, you want to know perhaps what your precipitation estimate is, rain or snow. This gives you an idea if you don't have any other way of telling. And then finally, in the lower right-hand corner is a, a quality index. Um, yeah, hey, it's, I'll explain this in a minute. It's, it's a little bit complicated, but we're trying to get at the idea that simple users really have been requesting a stoplight. Do, you, do I use this in a given place or not? OK, so here's the explanation of that. Um, if you have been following um, I merge. This is a slight revision. The, uh, the basic idea is that we're using a approximate Kalman filter correlation, which comes out of ping ping stuff. And the, the, the revision is that in the you know, last few bullets here, it's been revised to a 0.1 degree grid. We were originally working at a quarter. Um, and the the values when there is an overpass previously in version 5, if you looked at that, was given a value of 1, which is said, uh, this is the best we can do. But now we're actually estimating the correlation even at time equals 0, uh, which is an overpass by the microwave. We have a range of, of values. Uh, the problem is uh, a good index like this should be traceable back to a quantitative value so you know why you have an index of good, medium, or bad. And so this is our attempt to do that. We've done this quantitative thing, and now we've looked at the parameters and, and have some sense that, say, 0.6 to 1 is probably you know, pretty good and probably pretty usable. What we're not so sure of is whether this is the right parameter at the half hour scale for whether this is a good number or not. When you animate this, it, it flashes pretty horribly because the, the microwaves are, you know, microwave satellites are making their rounds around the Earth. And so an area that's green one half hour, two half hours later might be you know, sort of a dark orange. Um, so it remains for the, the users to tell us whether this is the right, you know, whether we guessed right. At the monthly scale, this is unchanged from version 5. Um, this is an old scheme that I put together um, a long time ago where we actually look at the at the error which we're estimating in each monthly grid box and trying to say, if you un invert that, it turns out the, the error estimate is simple enough. You can invert that and say, how many gauges would it take to give you that error? Hence the name equivalent gauge. And what you see is over the vast expanse of the ocean, where there's a reasonable amount of rain, you're getting a number of gauges at or slightly above four gauges in a two by 
2.5 by 2.5 grid box. That's pretty, and that's considered pretty reasonable at the monthly scale. Um, over land, it tends to be driven by the number of gauges you actually have. And um, in some cases, like over the central United States, you find out that the GPCC is not getting all the gauges from the US, despite their best efforts. Um, but the difference is that in places like Central Africa, where there's no gauges, it doesn't go to zero. It goes to a low number, which is dependent on the sampling by the satellites. So we think this is uh, this is proved to be pretty robust. Okay, so what am I doing? What are we doing now in version six? Um, in order to go back into the trim error with some limitations in the IR data set we have, we had to switch to a different kind of 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 uh, data in order to compute the morphing vectors. We did a lot of work. Um, Jackson Tan, the, one of the names on the list at the beginning, did a lot of this work and, you know, he'd bring something in and we'd go, oh, wow, that looks bad. And go back and <laughs> we, it took some effort, but in fact, it, it, it worked unreasonably well. Uh, we got to done a lot faster than we expected. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The morphing precipitation is now can be extended to 90 degrees north to south because we're actually using reanalysis data, which is globally complete. Uh, modify the quality index, which you've already seen. Uh, full calibration to the, to the combined. In version five, we took some shortcuts, and in a few cases, you could tell. Um, and then we had to start making modifications in order to go back into the trim error, because things aren't exactly the same. In particular, the calibrator of record in the trim error is the trim combined. And so we now have to had to do work getting, making sure the intercalibrations of the older satellites against trim worked. And then that, um, the other thing about trim, the other outstanding thing about trim is that the trim satellite only goes 35 north to south. GPM goes 65 to 65. And so in that extra space from 35 to 65, we had to come up with approximate monthly climatological calibrations, which reflect the trim era, but also the, the GPM era. And so um, that's, there's some you know, detailed, what I'll call engineering, engineers object to that, but I'll call engineering to get things to sort of look somewhere between GPM for the pattern and trim for sort of the magnitude of the, of the adjustments. Another thing that was sort of caught us by surprise is that users started complaining to us that we had a maximum precipitation rate of 50 millimeters per hour. Well, if you, all of these products are still really aimed at the mean precipitation. And so anytime the precipitation rate got up to 50, we were like, that's a pretty big number. It's, you know, so in fact, in a, well, and so we made some changes to the way things are represented internally so that now the maximum is 200. That's still not the absolute maximum, obviously, but the chances of GPROF correctly inferring something over 200 millimeters an hour is really pretty small. The other thing is that the, the changes we made to the internals uh, removed the discretization, which had, had been implicit in the way we represented data internally to conserve space. The result of this, besides those obvious things, is that the files are now bigger because they don't compress as well. You now have floats instead of a bunch of discrete values, which can be represented by I2s, basically. The other thing is that ha without doing some additional work, you get really tiny numbers. And so we've already gotten queries from users like, I'm seeing numbers of 10 to the minus 4. Is that true? Well, no. <laughs> but we. Um, it, Probably in this version, we're just going to let it go. But in fact, in the next version, we will probably uh, do something to limit the number of you know, significant figures, say round to the nearest thousandths of a millimeter per hour or something, which is still way more precision than is possible out of the algorithms. But we'll let the files compress, and we'll sort of get rid of this problem that you have this, these little areas of really, really light precipitation where you're just above zero in, when you do real math. Okay, so let's go back to the morphing part. And 
I could probably have Ping Ping stand up here and tell you about this better than I. Um, this is an example from the Western Equatorial Pacific for a particular season in 2017, where for an imagers and sounders, which are treated as two separate groups, but lumped together, so all the imagers, all the sounders, and then the infrared at three different times, um, if you take time equals zero, which is the, the swath overpass time, and then you start stepping out every half hour, you morph data forward and backward, half hour, hour, hour and a half, and so on. And the question is, what's the mean correlation in the Kalman filter statistics? And what you see, and this is, you know, this goes right back to the original papers on the Kalman filter uh, pa approach, is that the, it drops off pretty drastically. So that by the time you get out here around two hours or maybe even less, you've basically gotten to the point where the infrared is better than taking the microwave overpass at a time and moving it forward without changing it or moving it backwards without changing it. That's because the, the systems are, are evolving. You see that the correlation for IR is pretty low, but it's not zero. It adds value, particularly in those, the wings. Yeah, so you, you get pictures like this, but it's, it's by large areas around the globe, so it can account for differences in the relationships, um, duration of systems, and so on. Okay, and so um, this is an example of maps. Now, this is just at time, whoops, I keep wanting to point with my hand. Um, this is at time equals zero. This is the overpass time, and what the correlation is between um, the estimated correlation is that you sort of think between the actual overpass and what it should be. And so what you see is that it's pretty uniform for the sounders uh, because they do scattering type of like, estimates every place, ocean and land. And so there, is some, there are some gradients, and in particular in this case, um, for this, uh, the beginning of the fall season in the northern hemisphere, you see that it shades up actually a little bit higher in the, in the northern <coughs> latitudes over land. Interestingly, over ocean, the imagers are much better because they're not using both scattering and, and emission signals. But over land, they actually show out a little bit worse in this particular month, uh, season, than uh, the sounders. Now, that's a bit of a quandary for me because we have always prioritized imagers over sounders in both land and ocean in terms of if you have two, which one do you show? We're actually, so we aren't necessarily picking, according to this measure, we're not necessarily picking the best uh, satellite where we have overpasses that overlap. Um, yeah. So maybe in version seven we have to pay attention to that. So this is a, our example of of the morphing um, vector. You know, which which source should we use? Um, what you see across the top of the graphic is uh, TQV is a vertically integrated vapor. This happens to be out of Mira. Um, we tested the look, tracking the uh, total precipitation coming out of Mira. Uh, here's the infrared um, estimate uh, tracking. And then this doesn't seem like this should be a, a, a competitive uh, thing, but in fact, what happens if you have no motion? What if it's just assume that the motion is none? It turns out that's pretty competitive, and that's a little bit scary because what it says is this, there's a lot going on here. Even if you track things exactly right because the systems evolve, you're not going to get 100% correlation. And what you see here is that in the tropics, so this is the Heidecke skill score, uh, what you see is in the tropics, things are not as good as they are in mid-latitudes. And that's maybe not surprising because in the mid-latitudes, you have the storm systems that are moving along and motion is more important. Um, the, the others are really competitive. You know, it's, there's not a lot of separation. But the reality is, in our current situation, we don't have the IR data available, so we have to use something else during the trim era. Um, yeah. And so the last line is really true. Going into version 7, we really want to work on this 
um, at all latitudes and see you know, if we made a good choice. We chose in Mira because they're downstairs from us at Goddard, and so we can go down and yell at them if things don't work. Uh, in addition, how many people here use URA interim or URA5? Anybody? Yeah. I, we're, we're seeing problems with the continuity of the data fields. We should talk. I, I don't know. It's, it's a little bit scary. And so we feel like we bet on the right horse with Mira and what we have good access to. Okay, well, blazing right along. So how are we doing? We, we started this um, process, and so here's uh, an example of, of the calibration. So the idea is that Cora, the, the combined, is calibrated as GPCP over the oceans outside of the range 30 degrees north to south. And then the GPM constellation estimates are calibrated to the combined. The adjustments work roughly as intended. Um, and so you see, for example, particularly here, well, the southern hemisphere gets really squirrely. In this particular month, June, July, August, which is a southern hemisphere winter, um, what you see is that the combined unadulterated, the red line, drops dramatically after about 40 degrees. Now, if we calibrated to that, we'd be, we'd be dead. Um, if you look at the GPCP, the blue line, uh, it's a lot higher. There's still some funny business going on here at 60. Bob and I frequently <laughs> worry about that. And if you calibrate, the calibration scheme we've got is the light green line, which is maybe a little bit invisible from the back. But the light green line roughly follows GPCP. There are some differences. And then finally, iMERGE, um, using that calibrated CORA as the basis, is the black line. And it's not exactly the same. And we still sort of scratch our heads about the details. It, it looks a lot the same most places, but you do see around, say, minus 40, 45, and also in the peak in the tropics, deep tropics, um, the GPCP, or the iMERGE is noticeably higher. I will point out that iMERGE subsetted to the coincident CORA is much closer to CORA. So I, this is totals. This is everything for that three-month period. Um, and so in some sense, there are things going on when there's not a, a, a combined overpass, which is giving us different answers. Those of you with sharp eyes will notice that the black line does something funny at the southern end. This is 100% ocean. And 100% ocean, by the time you get to 65 degrees south, it has a lot of ice where we're not making estimates. So this is <clears throat> black line south of about 60 is it's a little bit bogus. OK. So here's an early result. Uh, this is June, July, August from the GPM era. It's a diurnal cycle. But this is not exactly a diurnal cycle you're used to for the globe. What I've done is to is to resort all of the half hours so that you're seeing the same local standard time every place. So you see in sort of very light letters, there you go, in the, um, in the lower left-hand corner is the local standard time. Okay, so when it's noon, it's noon every place in this picture to the nearest half hour. And I do this because if, the, if there's a, a you know, there's sort of this standard thing that over the continents, you tend to get a blossoming of convection in the late afternoon. All the continents should be blossoming together. If the oceans are giving you an, a pre-dawn maximum in the deep convection, every place in the ocean does that should be breathing together. Um, so I think I see this as sort of insightful. In smaller areas like the CONUS, sure enough, you know, you see the, the convection blossoming along the the eastern edge of the Rockies in the mid-afternoon, and then it progresses, turns into these MCCs that crunch across the Great Plains in the nighttime hours. Meanwhile, Florida is in a very different place, right? It's got the diurnal maximum in the late afternoon, and then it, it, the sea breeze turns into a land breeze and pushes offshore. Some really cool stuff going on in the maritime continent. You could really spend a lot of time looking at this. I will point out that um, there's better data coverage here at high latitudes than there used to be. 
And there's also less flashing. If you're used to version 5, there's inter-satellite calibration was an issue, and there's still some other things going on, but it's better. Um, you will see a few pulses in the Southern Ocean, which are probably not real. But on, overall, we're doing better. Also, we still have, thanks to um, not enough quality control, we still have artifacts along the, the ice edge that we haven't tamed yet. I, we have put these together not only for the globe, for the summer, northern hemisphere summer, but we actually have all of these. And at the last provocation, I will, I will send you examples. Uh, Jackson happens to be from Southeast Asia, so he's actually got, you know, here's a Singapore. <laughs> it's a cute little, you know, five grid boxes. Okay, so this is a little bit more quantitative. This is once again the, the June, July, August diurnal cycle, but now uh, Jackson has specialized it to just a few states in the, in the Great Plains area. And it's a sort of busy, I merge, whoops, I should be pointing. iMERGE is in solid, and the MRMS, the uh, National Weather Service uh, multi-radar, multi-sensor product, is in dashed. And so presumably MRMS is pretty close to true. And the question is, how close is iMERGE? Different states are different. I think if you average the whole thing, we wouldn't be too far off. But um, you see, for example, the, the blue line which sort of stands out because it's different than the others, Colorado. And so you see that the amplitude of, of the diurnal cycle is noticeably lower, although the phasing is about right. One of the things that we're very sensitive to is the phasing because we still have some infrared data. And if you know infrared data, you know that tends to have a diurnal cycle that lags. Um, so it turns out the phasing on these is pretty good, but the amplitude is still a work in progress. Okay, so this is a revisit of an oldie. Um, Hurricane Harvey happened in August of 2017, and shortly after version 5 came out. And so we went blazing in and we did diagnostics of the Hurricane Harvey results in the you know, Houston environs. And we're shocked to discover that it wasn't very good. Uh, oh dear. So MRMS is shown in the upper left-hand corner. And what you see, we've got these two red boxes. The one over the Houston area we call area one. The one to the north we call area two. And the reason we're doing that is because originally in version five, uh, near real time, Houston was underestimated and, and box two was overestimated. So it's, it's interesting to see what's going on now in version six. And admittedly, this is the final. So that means that there's gauge calibration already in the product. What you see is the uncalibrated that is before the gauge calibration is applied in the lower left-hand corner, looks, uh, you know, there's a good family resemblance with the MRMS. And when we go to the calibration by gauge, it actually sort of takes you away from the, the right result. That says that the GPCC gauge analysis didn't quite capture all of the, we think, didn't quite capture all of the, the really nasty stuff that they were getting out of Houston. That's possible because the gauges were underwater. MRMS has the advantage of having radar, and so even if the gauges are getting washed away, you still have the radar signal, right? The infrared, which is a calibrated, microwave calibrated version, um, looks you know, low, but it's, you know, once again, it's got the right idea, but it's, it's low in this particular case, and that has to do with the way we're doing the calibration. Um, yeah. So I comment here that the uncal is probably fairly close to what the late would look like. So if you're using near real time late, it probably would look something like that, whereas the final is the one in the upper right-hand corner. OK. Um, here's one of my eye tests for the, uh, the talk. Uh, sort of busy, but basically I've taken the two areas. Top is area one, bottom is area two. And then the various, the, the four types of estimates that I showed in the previous, and plotted it as a function of time, starting on the 25th of, of August on the left, and going to the ending just before the 1st of September. So this is essentially the whole period when Harvey came and perched on top of, of Houston. 
And what you see here is, you know, there's a lot of details that you have to look at. But one of the really important things is that the dots, the colored, different colored dots, are different satellites that, that gave you the microwave estimate during that time period, averaged over each of the boxes. And what you see is the dots are determinant in, in figuring out where iMERGE can go. So we live by the, the estimates and we die by the estimates. Um, and in area two, area one, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're, only, we're only looking at the solid hydrometeors over land, uh, the scattering channels. And so um, in some sense, the satellites tend to look like each other, but not necessarily like MRMS. And so in area one, for example, you see the, the dots are sort of an agreement that MRMS is too low until suddenly MRMS goes way up and the satellite says that it's about the same. So if you just looked at the satellite data, you'd say this time period on the 27th had sort of more or less the same, you know, it was bouncing around, but more or less the same level of precipitation over area one, while MRMS wants it to be a lot different. There are some questions about the calibration of MRMS, but I'm still going to take that as closer to true than the satellite data. Um, yeah. I also comment here, this is a, a real general comment, but it's illustrated well here. The short inter interval differences show some kind of cancellation when you take the whole event. But if you're just interested in the short interval, oh, for example, you want to do floods, the dramatic, there can be some dramatic differences when you're, ca when you're accumulating 51 inches of rain in a three-day period. Okay, um, this is hot off the press, and thanks to this, we're temporarily pausing our production. So um, the black line is the new iMERGE version 6. The red line, which is only in the GPM era, is the old iMERGE version 5, and the green line is the TMPA. Once again, my apologies for the green being that light. Um, and what you see is that there are some differences, systematic differences between version 5 and version 6 in the GPM era. Um, at least part of that we believe is, you know, if we are using different scaling, and sure enough, it's different. In the trim era, things look pretty similar. Um, until you get up to June of 2009. And so when we saw this plot, you know, it was like hot off the press and the data had just been dumped. It's like, oh, okay, we need to figure out what's going on in 2009, which is systematically different from both the rest of version seven uh, TMPA as well as version six iMERGE. Um, so that's uh, the guys back at the ranch are working on this while I get to get, stand up here and give a talk. Um, I would say the short-term trend, to the extent, you know, I, it's in quotes because it's not really a trend. The short-term trend is similar for all the GPM era data sets, but it's flatter for iMERGE than TMPA during the trim era, at least the part we've got up until 2009. Um, wow, there's something going on here that, you know, it's going to be interesting. The other part is, if you, if you can look at the details, um, the, it turns out that all of TMPA and the uh, trim era iMERGE have a very heavy semi-diurnal cycle, uh, semi-annual cycle, get two bumps in each year. iMERGE doesn't work that way during the GPM era, but TMPA continues to have a semi-diurnal cycle, semi-annual cycle. So it's not clear what's going on there either. So we're not done yet. Okay, schedule. Um, in early March, we began the retrospective processing of the final, the research quality during the GPM era. Done. It's out. You can look at it. Um, I'm hoping that you know this is really real. Then uh, underway, we're doing this final run reprocessing in the trim era. Um, there's some words there that tell you that the first month of data is for June 2000. And then we're going to do retrospective processing also for the early and late through the entire record, uh, but they depend on the, the final. So we do the final first, and then we do the early and late. So that's coming. And finally, uh, starting May 1st, um, we started the initial processing, that is processing with new data, 
for the early and late near real time. So, so as an example of what you get out of all this stuff, whoops, no, that comes next, sorry. Hold that thought. Um, development work, we're not done. Not a surprise, but we're not done. Um, in some cases, there are multi-satellite issues. For example, um, we need to improve error estimation. This has turned out to be a lot harder problem than we thought it was going to be 20 years ago. And we're not done yet. And I'm hoping some smart people are going to help on that. Advertisement for graduate students. If you're looking for a hard long-term problem, this is a hard long-term problem. Um, we want to ad develop additional data sets in addition to the observation only, which would include model estimates. We know there are problems with model estimates, particularly in the diurnal cycle, but particularly at high latitudes, that might be a useful thing to actually have in a product which users are interested in, even if the model people can't use it for validation once we introduce model data. Uh, there are also algorithm problems in general. And I have a laundry list here. These are going to be posted. These slides, I'm not going to go through this in detail. Uh, but needless to say, the high latitudes are really the frontier of where we are, we're working. We expect the new version to come in about two years. As, as release time has gone forward, that's also pushed the schedule on this. So like 2021, 2022 is probably when this would come out at the earliest. And if there are hitches along the way, we're the last product to come out, then we would get pushed down some more. OK, now we have the example. Um, this is the first uh, test that Jackson Tan did. And we chose it because there were six tropical storms during this time period. This is last year, starting with the uh, 11th of September. There are four in the Atlantic and two in the Pacific. And so it seemed like a really great first test. Since then, we've actually started getting these produced in near real time by the Science Visualization Studio. And so the, the address across the bottom, uh, you can go to these. They get updated every hour. And so you can see what the last week of precipitation looks like according to our algorithm. Um, If you're a meteorologist, you could spend the, the rest of the afternoon looking at this and picking out features. It's just all kinds of cool stuff going on here. Um, so I will leave this mostly to your imagination. The, the one, this tropical storm coming in on the coast of the US is Florence. Um, and so you get a sense of what our visualization of the precipitation looked like. Um, in addition, I would point out that in the Southern Hemisphere, um, Relampago just was done in Argentina, some of the biggest, nastiest storms on the planet. And you know, you get, from the comfort of your own office, you can watch them crunch across the countryside. Um, the coloring is uh, hmm, not, oh, it's on the top. The blues are estimated to be snow. The bright colors are estimated to be rainfall. I think there's one more. Yeah. And so just to wrap things up, I will remind you what I was talking about. Uh, we're doing an upgrade this spring. Um, the product structure remains the same as in the previous version, five tenths of a degree, half hourly. Um, we've introduced a new source for the morphing vectors, and we are providing more high latitude coverage. We're going back to 2000 now, and eventually we hope to you know, get the data to go back to 1998. And finally, we've tried to improve the quality index, which we hope is useful to the, the average user. So with that, I'm going to stop and entertain questions. Thank you. Question. Uh, Judge, would you please uh, bring back the, uh, the uh, Hurricane Harvey case? I'm a little bit confused about, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about why the uh, um, the uh, uh, calibrated uh, just bring that the uh, or uh, total rainfall down because of the uh, uh, rain gauge network didn't catch the uh, heavy rain over the uh, Houston area, or? Did you, did you, did you mean this one? No, no. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, the top uh, yeah. right one. What a good question. So our, 
once again, late last week, we finally got to the point of being able to produce this. And so our best guess right now is that this precipitation cal is related to this mostly by a scaling by the GPCP. And so that's driven in this area by the, by the GPCC gauge analysis. So we haven't had time, but my, my guess is that the GPCC analysis, partly because we're working with one degree data, but also because it's a relatively sparse gauge sample, is that this simply didn't have a chance to pick up the, the high rain, which was in a relatively small area here in the, in the gauge analysis. And so the gauge analysis just takes those high values and squashes them down. Mm. Like okay. I think you said, George, you, that's the final product up there. Right. right. So this is, yeah, this is the one we would normally say use this one right. because it has a gauge in it. The one at the bottom left is essentially the late product. Yeah. Does not have any gauge information. Explicit, yeah. There's no explicit. So if, you know, if we had, if we chose to spend more time getting more control over the gauge analysis, if we went to daily gauges, for example, this would probably get affected. But I, I want to be a little bit careful because we haven't had a chance to look. But the overwhelming likelihood is that we just this got squashed by, by bringing in gauge analysis, which didn't have the high value. So, uh, we check, we compared the data gauge uh, analysis with, uh, with the satellite estimates and with the radar. And the gauge analysis is based on a much dense station network and uh, derived on a one S degree by one S degree uh, resolution. So what we found uh, were uh, several things. Number one, uh, the radar maximum is located at uh, different uh, positions compared to gauge. Of course, there is possibility that uh, m maybe some of the gauges have some problems, uh, but the, the displacement is, uh, is not kind of net grid kind of thing. So, Maybe there is also issue with radar things because the radar is not uh, looking at well, the real rain. It's looking at the uh, the water droplets inside the clouds, especially with heavy rain. For uh, it may have some problems, saturation issues. Uh, number uh, number two is that well, setup estimates tend to smooth out the the maximum, but uh, not as bad as what you show here, as you have already said. Part of the reason is because you're looking at uh, one degree by one degree. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. George, can you go to the next slide, please? The next one, I look on this one. So I'm surprised to see the different uh, estimation. This one. Yeah, differ so much. In particular, if you look at the green, green curve, the green curve is an IR product which follow almost upside the uh, trend, right? from the other product. Yeah. I, <clears throat> so the green, the green is the IR. Yeah. And, and so this is uh, Persian CCS. And so to a certain extent, they, so they take the, the IR field and they look at not only brightness temperature, but also texture. And so they've broken the, the IR field into, into um, areas that have different brightness temperature rain relationships. So to a certain extent, you hope they take into account the fact that some places are lumpy but relatively warm compared to other places that are cold and very flat. Um, we sort of think what's going on here, you know, the background is that there, this is particularly in area one, this is a very tropical situation. And so, um, it's possible that that initial high estimate, whoops, point, 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 that this high estimate <coughs> is, is telling you it's picking up particular clusters that are, that are, you know, high rain rate, and it's depending on the last three months of data. And so over the last three months of data, that kind of cluster got this amount of rain. And so that's not necessarily representative of this very anomalous event in this particular time. You would sort of hope with Persian CCS, it would be enough, this clustering would give you more, um, 
discrimination. What we haven't done yet, and even as I say this, that we should do this, is just take our old precipitation match threshold, see how it does. You know, is it better or worse? I don't know. Ping Ping, do you have a sense of how your IR did in this case? We have rechecked uh, the performance of IR based precipitation estimates. Basically, one important issue, well, IR based precipitation technique is always an empirical approach which means you try to establish a relationship between precipitation and whatever IR is looking at. In our case, it's just the cloud top temperature. And in, in this case, cloud top temperature plus some structure, uh, structure issues. But uh, even yet, well, even <coughs> with those two parameters, basically the relationship is empirical and it's heavily weather, weather regime dependent and one a weather, new weather regime comes in, if you do not update the relationship in time, you will see those kind of things. Uh, interesting also showing here is that if you're looking at a long, uh, long, uh, longer time scales, like from the all the way left to all the way, all the way uh, left to right, you can see the green line, the average of the green line should be very close to whatever the calibrated is. Just one certain uh, stage is overestimated. Uh, and yeah, the over, other, under, uh, over, yeah. yeah. Other place you will see underestimates. So the calibration basically it's always number one thing is to ensure the mean meets the mean. So that's what you see. So I think one uh, critical uh, thing, uh, people whoever want to work on IR based technique, is how to quickly uh, refresh the relationship, the relationship to reflect the weather region changes. Well, I'll use this excellent opportunity <clears throat> to, to make a plug for something which should be on the horizon for us, which is multi-spectral. Multi the geo data is more than just my, uh, infrared. At the bare minimum, there's visible, yeah, only during the day, but there's visible and there's the water vapor channel. And we already know there's published work that says those three channels give you a better estimate at night only two channels than IR by itself. The problem my, from my perspective is Ping Ping sends us this lovely data set it's gridded and intercalibrated and zenith angle corrected just for IR. People in my position are unlikely to make progress on the multi-spectral if we don't get to the point where we have a similar data set one way or another for the other two channels. And I understand that visible is a hard problem Water vapor, not so hard, but still, it's not trivial. And so we need, to, we need to be pushing the community forward to the point where we can do all three channels, not just one, because geo is here to stay. We know that to be true, and if we're going to do the long record, we need to go back in time. So, put box away. Another question here. Yep. Uh, this is a great um, product and uh, excellent uh, talk. So I'm uh, very interested in using this data, so I want to know what the data format and uh, uh, where I can download and how to use it. Do you have? Thank you for the plug. Um, so the answer to that is, is that uh, the, the native format is HDF5. But if you go to uh, PMM NASA Gov, and then there's a get data button, and you click on the get data button and choose GPM, it opens iMERGE by default. And so there's the whole list of how you can get the data. It's not just HDF5, it's also in GeoTIFFs with world, view, world files, whatever that's, it's a you know, GIS format. Uh, Net CDF, there's various ways to download. You can subset in, by parameter and, and space. Um, and then there are value added products that do accumulation. So if you want to work with three hour daily, weekly data, you can get those as well. And so, ask if you have questions. Okay, great, thank you. And we have an online uh, question here from Pete Peterson. He's asking, are the daily GIS GeoTIFF files identical to the sum of the iMERGE half hourly HDF5 files? Yeah, so, so we have, it's in GIS compatible files now. If they, if they go to PMM NASA Gov and navigate their way down to iMERGE, 
they'll see a listing. And that's a fairly popular data set. I, I, so if they have problems getting started, they should ask and we'll get them help. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, with then, let's uh, ramp up and thanks to the speaker again.